Science fiction has popularized asteroid mining and cities in the sky, but could the future of mining be in cloud cities hanging far above distant worlds? As we get ready to finally start returning to the moon and contemplating mining it to get to the resources we need to settle the rest of the solar system, it is a good reminder that very little of the actual resources in our solar system, and probably most others, is in conveniently mineable low gravity airless moons and minor planets. Off of Earth, in our own inner solar system, Venus makes up more mass than everything else there combined. Mercury, Mars, our moon, Mars zone two little tiny moons, and the millions of asteroids in the belt, yet its surface is covered with a terribly thick atmosphere whose contents are more like something coming out of a rocket jet than what people inside that rocket could live and breathe. Beyond the belt we have the gas giant Jupiter, which outmasses every other planet in the solar system combined, and most of that remaining mass is in its smaller sibling Saturn which itself has the largest moon in the solar system, Titan, with a thicker atmosphere than Earth's. Most of the remaining mass is in the two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. All these bodies are surrounded by thick atmospheres which make getting material off the surface very difficult, and sometimes bordering on the nonsensical to even discuss, with places where the surface rains diamond or acid or is a dense core that would crush and burn any known material in an eye blink. And yet the atmospheres of these places might themselves be gold mines of resources and that's what we'll be discussing today. First we'll look at worlds like Venus and Titan, then move on to the ice giants and Hycian planets like Uranus and Neptune, and then we'll move on to gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, where we can discuss setups like the cloud city of Bespin from Star Wars. Finally, we'll look at how to mine resources directly from our Sun and other stars, or even stellar remnants. We'll begin our discussion on Venus and then move to Titan, each of which represents a very different type of target but which will likely use similar technologies for harvesting it. And the reason they are of interest to us initially is because their atmospheres have an abundance of nitrogen. Venus's atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide at 96.5%, and truthfully that doesn't interest us too much as a resource in space colonization because carbon and oxygen are both plentiful pretty much everywhere but virtually all the remainder of that is nitrogen, and Venus's atmosphere is nearly a hundred times as massive as Earth's. So while most of Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen and that is vital to plant life, Venus has a supply far greater than our own. Oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen are the third, fourth, and seventh most abundant elements in the Universe, as a fraction of mass, and in our solar system as well. If you're curious, first and second are hydrogen and helium, and fifth and sixth are neon and iron. Helium and neon are noble gases, meaning they only form molecules of just themselves, monoatomic. A molecule's total mass is the principal control on whether or not it gets blown away into deep space by solar wind and radiation, so the lighter molecules don't stick around much, and thus even though they are very common in general, it's very hard to find either helium or neon in the inner solar system outside of the Sun itself, which holds onto them by sheer gravitational strength. Hydrogen doesn't do much better, but it can bond to other heavier atoms, like oxygen to form water, or carbon to form methane, or nitrogen to form ammonia. Unfortunately nitrogen is less common than oxygen or carbon, and by quite a lot and it isn't as good at sticking around hot planets. Nonetheless, if we want to be building ecologies inside large space habitats, like O'Neill cylinders, we'll need a lot of nitrogen, and if we want to terraform Mars or paraterraform place like the Moon, we'll need a lot more. Regardless, nitrogen and carbon dioxide can be separated in a variety of ways. I don't think a centrifuge would be the most efficient process but it's always an option for separating gases of significantly different molecular mass, especially if you don't need to worry about purity. Nitrogen is our main interest in early settlement in this solar system, but that won't be true everywhere and every win. So centrifuges are an option that basically works on everything. You suck in some gas and spin it fast, and the same centrifugal force that we use for spin gravity in rotating habitats will let the denser molecules separate to the bottom and the lighter ones float up or toward the center. Carbon dioxide is nearly half again the mass molecular nitrogen is, 
so it's an easy enough separation, and the centrifuges can be mounted on the same type of buoyant stations that we envision floating on Venus's upper atmosphere, which is heavy enough that a balloon full of oxygen and nitrogen would float, so people can live in blimps high above Venus. You could potentially use your blimps engines to run your centrifuges when not running your propellers at full speed. The key to any competitive mining operation is going to be about overall efficiency, so any place where you can get two for the price of one, or use surplus resources for another purpose that are only required for their main purpose intermittently is probably a good way to go. Cryogenic distillation is another technique for separating out nitrogen, and a popular one here on Earth where nitrogen under pressure and cooled will turn to a liquid right out of the air. The usual technique on Earth is to compress a bunch of air, which will heat it up, then let it cool to the local environment's temperature, about 10 Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit. Then, once it's reached that local temperature, you release the compression, and the gas suddenly expands and cools, and assuming you've left enough room to expand, to the necessary temperature and pressure it would liquefy at, it will condense just like steam and you've got liquid nitrogen. It's simple enough to separate liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen from each other too, on Earth, though the process would be different doing it for carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Carbon dioxide, for instance, is never a liquid at standard pressure, but does have a liquid form and even at room temperatures for high enough pressure. We use this trick to get carbon dioxide out of natural gas, a process we call sweetening of natural gas, and for context, when you burn natural gas in conjunction with oxygen, the byproduct is carbon dioxide and water, and you don't want either in your combustion mix. We also have the mechanical molecular sleeve option which is handy in cases where you mostly have two molecules of very different sizes and again don't care much about purity. Essentially you make very skinny filters and press the gas through them, and the smaller molecules make it through the sieve and the big ones don't. Graphene, that wonder material we always love for contemplating space elevators, is often proposed as a material for making a molecular sieve out of, and given that it's simply carbon, you don't really need to worry about running out of it on Venus. There are quite a few other methods of separation, and I would imagine a competent chemist would know even more that I've never heard of, but those are the big ones in terms of near-universal effectiveness and simplicity. Given that Venus is full of carbon dioxide, it is likely that our ever-growing pool of knowledge about carbon sequestration will come in handy there and offer some other methods. We can also cheat by letting temperature remove most of the carbon dioxide by first shading the planet so that it cooled and then rained carbon dioxide into the oceans below it, a technique for terraforming Venus we discussed in detail in our episode Winter on Venus. This technique may be fairly limited in application at the galactic scale. It is hard to say how many Venusian planets would be in the galaxy with its thick atmosphere but ultra-slow rotation and minimal magnetosphere unlike most of the others we'll discuss today which ought to be very common. The advantage Venus has going for it is that we have a huge supply of power available and all day round, since a refinery can hover in Venus's atmosphere, sucking the local air in while crawling across its surface and staying perpetually in sunlight, as Venus's day is so long, hundreds of Earth's days, that a blimp moving at human jogging speed could keep up with the sunset. A non-stop high-intensity solar power supply is a powerful industrial tool and also allows options like a mass driver floating high in the sky for firing pods of nitrogen off to planets or space habitats awaiting them. Those pods might be made of artificial diamond or graphene made from that plentiful carbon. On the flip side, Titan, far out in orbit of Saturn, does not have that abundant solar power. However, large cold moons with large quantities of nitrogen probably are common enough. Titan's atmosphere is somewhat thicker than Earth's, not a hundred times as thick like Venus, but it's 95% nitrogen and 5% methane. That methane provides a plentiful source of hydrogen, so you can float around as a blimp here too, or by scooping helium from Saturn, which we'll get to later. But you cannot have floating blimp refineries full of normal air because oxygen is a bit heavier than nitrogen and Titan's atmosphere is virtually all nitrogen, so an oxygen habitat is going to sink unless you keep it at partial pressure, which you could do. Titan has very low gravity and is rich in hydrocarbons you can burn as fuel for engines and to heat air like a hot air balloon, and Titan's local air is much cooler already. You have mundane ways to keep a refinery floating there, or alternatively flying under power and connected by a tether to the ground below, 
that it just orbited around a big circlet, with that tether scribing a cone shape pointing apex to the ground. And you could run trams up that elevator line from surface mines, Titan's atmosphere is tall but the gravity is low and the orbital speed lower. While a conventional space elevator does not work there, it's for the same reasons it doesn't on our own moon, and as we discussed recently in Lunar Space Elevators, for these moons which are tightly locked to their parent planet, you end up stringing it out to their L1 point rather than the local equivalent of geostationary, or to the L2 point behind that moon, opposite Saturn, or even trailing further beyond that, which allows a nice whip launch of cargo back into the system. In this regard, Titan is our better source for nitrogen and offers a very low power option for getting it. There are a lot of other places we can get it too, as we discussed in our episode Comet Mining, but this might be the optimal one for habitats around Earth and the inner system out to and including the asteroid belt until it was exhausted of that nitrogen. Without knowing the available future technologies better, it's hard to say if any of those other options will become superior options to Venus in that regard. What Titan has that Venus hasn't got is hydrogen, and while the other planets in the outer solar system have oceans more, they are trickier to access without a fusion economy or some extreme brute force engineering. Before we move on to those, it's worth asking if we are interested in anything besides nitrogen in these atmospheres and perhaps the hydrogen available in methane or ammonia or water vapor. And in the short term the answer is basically no, because they haven't got anything else in their atmosphere that we wouldn't find all over the place anywhere else we were working. At most, other elements might be shipped in simply because they are viewed as cheap by being a surplus waste product of another refining process, like oxygen would be for metal refining on the moon. Outside of our solar system though, that could shift. Pluto for instance has no significant atmosphere, nor does any other dwarf planet we have, but Titan proves objects in that mass range can have them and there is nothing stopping a planet out past the frost line from being more in the Earth mass range. We may even have some out in the scattered disk or Oort cloud, and those might have large quantities of neon or argon, or other noble gases like krypton or xenon in their atmospheres. We wouldn't want to rule out finding plants with phosphine in the atmosphere or other molecules with elements we wouldn't normally think would float about in the air for long. Worlds with volcanoes, normal or cryovolcanic, will also be spewing lots of atypical elements into the air, sulfur for instance, and sometimes even into orbit, and for today we will assume cases like that would count as atmospheric mining still. There's also the question of what still counts as atmosphere, which is a question that comes up when we start contemplating ice giants like Uranus and Neptune and Hycean worlds, hypothetical super-Earth planets with massive oceans under an atmosphere that's largely hydrogen but may still hold life. On a place like Neptune, we speculate it might rain diamonds at certain altitudes, and that the atmosphere might be deeper than our entire planet is wide, not just a thin layer around the planet like ours is. This obviously provides a motivation for mining the atmosphere, again it rains diamonds, but emphasizes that atmospheric mining has a lot of different types and levels. In the same way, I just said that Earth's atmosphere is a thin skin on our planet, but that's a touch arbitrary. Go more than mountain high and we cannot breathe anymore. But there's no distinct end to our atmosphere and most of our satellites and space station are placed inside that atmosphere, as we generally want things as close to the ground as we can get them without any significant air drag deorbiting our satellite or station. You can mine up at that altitude too, and we will return to that when we get to mining the sun later in the video, but atmospheric mining can vary from skimming off ions in the near vacuum up in orbit to mining so deep in a mega atmosphere that the pressure would crush a submarine and where you might need something as hard as diamond to build your facility out of. It's a good place to start looking at alternatives to buoyancy for keeping your refinery up in the air too. One advantage ice giants have over gas giants, and more so with Hycean worlds, is that your atmosphere is not just hydrogen and helium. We get significant if tiny amounts of ammonia, water, and methane, and that methane is thought to be the reason Uranus and Neptune are blue-green tinted. We also have trace amounts of other hydrocarbons like ethane, acetylene, methyl acetylene, diacetylene, and carbon monoxide. But to mine a place like Neptune or Uranus tends to imply you are no longer interested that much in hydrocarbons for energy. So what might really interest you there is the deuterium, which is at high concentration and likely vital for fusion economy, and the same for helium-3, 
which is vital to the harder but arguably more desirable aneutronic fusion reaction. Nonetheless, you can float in there, you can refine out hydrogen and that is likely be your main export from that world, that or possibly deuterium, and both are lighter than the average volume of air on Neptune or Uranus, or possibly any other ice giant, gas giant, or brown dwarf. On plants like this though you can only use hydrogen as even helium is too heavy to float a blimp. However, your basic refinery might be floating on its own huge storage tanks of hydrogen or deuterium awaiting shipment, and might even be able to let one free to float up higher for pickup, or on a tether to reel it back down for refill after pickup. Those heavier than methane hydrocarbons are thought to be far down, in a band about 100 miles wide at the bottom of Uranus's stratosphere, where the temperatures are colder than Antarctica and the pressure is still only about a hundredth to a ten thousandth Earth normal. So a buoyant refinery is probably down at the bottom of this layer and using hot hydrogen to keep the place floating. Buoyancy gets easier as we drop into the troposphere, and about at where the pressure would be equal or a bit greater than Earth norm, we start seeing methane cloud formation, and for the next hundred or so miles below that, the pressure rises to the point where a tough submarine could barely withstand it, and cloud layers of ammonia and ammonium bisulfide, and below that, water clouds. There is no limit beneath this where buoyancy stops working, and indeed it works even better at lower depths, but it all comes down to what you can make that can withstand that pressure. We've explored some extreme tech options in our episode Accessing Earth's Core, and in both cases there is an unimaginable amount and variety of resources down there if your tech can survive it. We can easily imagine running huge fusion plants or fusion candles, which we'll discuss in the Gas Giant section, and these might be enormous submarine city refineries made out of diamond or some other super hard material, but it's also likely we might use refineries up in the higher atmosphere suspended as orbital rings, with long tethers connecting to diving bell-like gathering devices which grab material and are pulled or float back up. We discuss that more, along with the Neptunian Chainsaw, a planet-sized bucket excavator, and chandelier cities hanging from such orbital rings in our episode Colonizing Neptune. When it comes to gas giants and brown dwarfs, we don't have to abandon buoyancy for all cloud cities yet, but it gets a lot more iffy and requires true immensity to make it work. Of course we can't rule out future options like anti-gravity, which is presumably what kept the Cloud City of Bespin floating in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, the best film of that franchise, but we want to mine these places if we can because they contain very nearly everything. Not including our own sun, Jupiter makes up almost three quarters of our solar system's mass, with very nearly all that remaining quarter in Saturn, with Neptune and Uranus making up very nearly all the rest. We want that matter, and we want all of it, and let's discuss how we get it. Now on Jupiter I could well imagine having harvesting facilities the size of continents, though still looking tiny compared to the planet, that were nearly hollow and full of hot, pure hydrogen. That will float and on board you have all your separating gear as your huge facility spins out hydrogen, deuterium, helium, helium-3, methane, ammonia, neon, and more and just mashes some of that methane into graphene walled tanks that then fill with high pressure gas or liquid, and those tanks might run down a massive linear accelerator or mass driver right into space. Or maybe it's an orbital ring, or down from that ring are your tethers that have extractors at their end or that connect to that buoyant continent, or maybe you're just sucking air in. For some context though, Jupiter's atmosphere varies a lot by altitude, but it's a violent and eternal storm, so if I wanted to make a diamond hard domed habitat there, where the floor and dome and everything else is generally only massing on an order of 100 kilograms a square meter, which is hardly thin and frail, then I need to be thinking about that structure under me or over me like an iceberg, and one kilometers deep and hollow and full of hot, pure hydrogen, or that buoyancy isn't working. If it isn't, this is where we have to either use suspension from an orbital ring or active powered flight. Of course if you've got great big fusion reactors in a fusion economy, this seems decently plausible, and then some sort of mix of aircraft carrier or Marvel Shield helicarrier seems a real option, but maybe with a dome on it, 
and the giant cannon running down its spine is for launching its cargoes. Or giant bullets, after all a structure like this might attract pirates or tempt enemy attack to cripple the fuel supply in a solar system wide conflict. And it helps to have big guns if Darth Vader shows up trying to push you around or altering your deals further. This is one of the reasons why we always talk about there being no such thing as an unarmed spaceship or atmospheric mining vehicle of this type. The sheer power involved in running the things tends to be convertible into a decent and insanely powerful weapon system. The same is true of fusion candles, which are basically a non-stop nova in the sky, blowing two jets of super hot plasma out. One it uses like a rocket flame to hoard itself up, and the other is for blasting matter into higher orbits or beyond. You can use these to jettison huge amounts of matter off the planet for easier access, potentially right down a magnetic funnel into a storage tank, but you can also use it to move planets around a solar system or take off their upper layers to get to the goodies below. There are a lot of them too. Heavier elements we think of as being from terrestrial planets or asteroids are vastly more abundant overall than those gas giants. It's just mostly down in the cores and at a far lower overall ratio, since they're still mostly hydrogen and helium. I should also note that we could see a need to be extracting megatons of hydrogen or deuterium from Jupiter every day to run a true fusion economy of major interplanetary civilizations, the kind you describe on the Kardashev scale. Between fueling spaceships for interstellar launches and running anything that solar power from the sun isn't optimal for, you can use a lot of hydrogen. Indeed if you were trying to replicate the power output of the sun, you'd need to burn 600 megatons of hydrogen every second, and even Jupiter or Saturn's massive supplies would only run it for tens of millions of years. And indeed, one of the things you might do atmospheric mining for is to bring the fuel from gas giants and brown dwarfs to stars or stellar remnants to refuel them. It emphasizes the sheer immensity of our sun that it's only halfway through its 10 billion year life and that giants like Jupiter or Saturn could only extend that life by a few percent. But one of the ways you can extend that life is by removing non-hydrogen elements from a star and that's where mining a star's atmosphere, called star lifting, comes into play. Star lifetimes are about how quickly a star either runs out of fuel or builds up fusion byproducts that poison the process. By removing helium and other heavier elements from our sun, we can extend our sun's lifetime many times over without needing to add in more hydrogen from Jupiter or Saturn or other extrasolar hydrogen sources. This is a solar powered technique, as you're right by the sun and using enormous mirrors to bounce light back down on the sun to further heat it while using the available energy to run large electromagnets. We discussed this process in detail along with some alternative methods in our episode Star Lifting and Refueling Our Sun, but all the matter on the sun's surface is ionized plasma and reacts strongly to electromagnetic effects. Thus you can funnel matter off the sun, aided by heating up to locally increase solar wind output, and then separate it electromagnetically too. Indeed you might do this process by default on red or orange dwarf stars by star boosting them with polar statite mirrors, which heats that star up to make a larger habitable zone around that star's equator and of a more sun-like spectrum, gaining those resources and that more habitable star in the process. As for separating the harvested material, an ion of iron and one of neon and helium and hydrogen all have different masses and will curve or accelerate differently in a magnetic or electric field, and so you can use that plus the sheer enormity of space to separate those ions at a low cost, which is also solar powered. So the process powers itself rather than needing something else and you're just using the sun's own sunlight to power its harvesting and cleaning. Folks wonder sometimes why taking the surface off a star will get you those heavy elements or helium from the core, but stars are like bubbling pots, some more than others, and while the concentration grows in the core, the reason stars go supernova from core poisoning of iron is because near the end that rate of fusion is going so fast that nothing has time to percolate around much. So you can use this trick even on big stars, indeed it is easier on them, but only if they're not too close to exploding yet. Were that the case, you would need some other approach like opening a wormhole into their core. So how much matter is in the Sun? Well ignoring the hydrogen and helium about 7,000 times Earth's own mass, 
and that mass is pretty parallel to what we find elsewhere, as it's what the solar system formed out of. The hydrogen, helium, and neon just blew away relatively quickly from most other things. Every other mine we might run in the solar system, whether it's on an asteroid or floating over Venus or drifting around the deep atmosphere of Neptune, all of them combined, won't add up to even 1% of the material we get out of the Sun. Folks wonder sometimes where we get the material for a lot of these mega projects we talk about on the show all the time, and that's your answer. And that trick works in any star system, better in some than others, but it means even low metallicity stars with no planets are going to be able to offer rich pickings compared to mining an asteroid belt. Even a pure hydrogen helium star could be sucked up to run a huge particle collider to make heavier elements, if you needed to, albeit with a much higher capital investment. But I'd emphasize that while star lifting is a huge project, it isn't really a high tech one, it's just mirrors, solar panels, and electromagnets. Doubtless more tech helps, but it isn't necessary and it offers you vast resources. And it lets you profit and build and grow while extending the lifetime of that stall. To me, that's the definition of a positive symbiotic relationship and a nice counterpoint to folks who sometimes hear us talk of harvesting the galaxy and compare humanity to locusts consuming all in sight. Lastly, if harvesting stalls isn't enough, you can use this sort of technique, in conjunction with harvested gas giants, to even rekindle stellar remnants. Very, very carefully. Those stellar remnants can be factories to make heavier matter. We think of all of our elements being made in supernovae from dying giant stars, but that is not the case. Even for the heavier elements not made in smaller stars, a lot of the material arrives from white dwarfs exploding from gaining too much new mass, or from neutron stars colliding. Now while we might detonate a white dwarf to liberate some of the matter inside it, generally this sort of process is better conducted in slower steps. We can use the insane gravity neo-neutron stars or black holes to run processes not seen outside of supercolliders. We may be able to use these to produce heavier elements far more efficiently than they did themselves when they died. For more on options like that, see our Black Hole series, particularly colonizing black holes. All in all, it shows that you don't need to do all your mining deep down inside dark holes, but can be out in the sunshine and fresh air, and that the future of atmospheric mining is a pretty bright one, especially when it's a star's atmosphere you're mining, of course. So today we talked about mining planetary atmospheres and the stars themselves, after we exhausted the easier to grab resources like comets and asteroids. We discussed mining comets and asteroids before, but I thought it would be interesting to explore the life of an asteroid miner, to ask what that would be like and what reasons people might have to become an asteroid miner. That's out now exclusively on Nebula, our streaming service, where we release a lot of bonus content, extra episodes and extended editions, and where every regular episode of the show also comes out ad-free and a few days early. By signing up for Nebula at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur and using code IsaacArthur, you get access to bonus content like Life as an Asteroid Minor, Nomadic Miners on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, Colonizing Binary Stars, and more. Using my link and discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during the episode. However, this month, September 2023, you can also get a lifetime membership to Nebula for as long as both you and Nebula exist for $300 which goes to developing more and bigger Nebula Originals and platform improvement, and if you sign up using my code, IsaacArthur, a third of that goes directly to the channel, and I'll place the link for that option in the description right under the normal one. Either way you join Nebula you get access to all of our content, early and ad-free, including the audio-only podcast, and access to tons of bonus content from our show and many other amazing creators. So for those curious, not only is this our first episode of Year 10 of the show, yesterday was my birthday and yeah the show's birthday and my own coincidentally coincide a few days apart, and wow has it been an eventful year. On a personal note, it's also the anniversary of my first date with my future wife Sarah, and also the anniversary of when we got the bios for our kids and acknowledgement that we were being formally considered to adopt them. 
We are still waiting for that process to finish up, but we do finally have permission to post photos of them and say their post adoption names, which is a great birthday present, and if you're curious, they are Christopher, Isabella, and Geometry Arthur, ages 7, 6, and 5 respectively, and I'm very grateful they've come into my life, major distractions and stress that they've been this last year. Hopefully year 10 of the show and 44 of my life go a bit more calmly than this last one did, even if it has been a very good year. Not least because I love my job making this show and I have one of the best audiences anyone could ever hope for. So that's it for today, but we have our live stream Q&A on Sunday, September 24th at 4pm Eastern, and then on the 28th we'll have an exploration of what traveling the galaxy as an adventurer or lone wanderer will be like and have spacesuit will travel. After that we'll jump into October to explain what vacuum and zero point energy are on October 5th, and then we'll have an episode not on spaceships but the factories that will make them on October 12th. Then it will be time for Sci-Fi Sunday on October 15th where we'll contemplate entire planets turned into giant factories in Forge Worlds and Industrial Planets. Then we'll ask the big question of if life extension is ethical on October 19th. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.